opening keynote. He's a writer, documentary film producer, and founder of Freedom Force International. He's listed in the who's who in America, and he deals with a full range of subjects from ancient earth history to the Federal Reserve System and international banking, the history of taxation, U.S. foreign policy, and a lot of you might know him from his book that's now in the fifth edition, The Creature from Jekyll Island. We are so pleased to welcome him to Virtual Blockchain Week 2020, Mr. G. Edward Griffin. Hello, good sir. Well, hello. So nice to see you again. Well, thank you. Where am I? I'm not sure what part of the world I'm in. I don't know. Can you turn up your microphone a little bit so we can, yes, can. hear you a little better? Uh, how does this sound? A little bit Keep better? going. Keep going. Keep going. Crank okay. it up. All right. Any better? That sounds fantastic. Now you're a rock star. A rock star. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, we, we, had the, we had the pleasure of chatting with you not so long ago, uh, Mr. Griffin. Uh, episode 351 of Bad Crypto, which was about... 50 episodes ago and oh so it's a, a great joy to have you back on well thank you it's a pleasure to be back on the so, world has changed since we last chatted <laughs> yeah everything's changing isn't it yeah let's let's just jump right in what in the world is going on especially in regards to the federal reserve well, that took me by surprise. The big question lately has been uh, like, what's going on with the coronavirus theater? And so I was sort of mentally prepared for that. But yeah, the Federal Reserve, let's not forget that baby, huh? Yeah, the Federal Reserve really, probably if we wanted to dig deep enough, we could find that the roots for all of our problems, including the coronavirus, go way down deep to the Fed, which means goes down to the the system whereby a very small group of powerful people can create the money supply in the United States. It's the same people and their, and their cousins, of course, who create the money supplies of all the other nations. So it's a pretty high-octane group. So when we talk about the Federal Reserve, we're really talking about a banking, international banking cartel. And I don't know if that r rings any bells in the minds of your viewers, but a cartel is um, generally considered not to be a good thing. Some people don't know what a cartel is, except that it's bad. But for the sake of our discussion, I think we ought to at least give it a brief definition. A cartel is a group of um, apparently independent companies, or businesses, they're usually corporations, that appear to be independent and appear to be competitors, but they have joined together for the purpose of reducing or eliminating competition between themselves so that they won't have to compete in the marketplace. They won't have to uh, worry about producing a better product or lowering their prices or anything like that. They all agree to have the same price, produce uh, the same products and the same specifications and the same, you know, everything is the same. So the consumer really doesn't have much choice. Uh, and so the world went into the realm of cartels about the turn of the last century back about in 1901, by that time, the United States was well on the road to oil cartels and, and uh, manufacturing cartels and railroad cartels. And that process has been, of course, continuing ever since. And we live in a world of cartels today. The health field is a cartel. And the, the, um, the, high t the industry of, that produces our electricity and our utilities, those are cartels. Would you call the, the social media and tech landscape cartel too? Of course, Apple, Every, Facebook, everything, everything of significance is a cartel. And you can see it in the, uh, in the, in the tech world, in the social media world. Uh, you know, YouTube and, and uh, Amazon and all, all of the channels of communication, they're all saying the same thing. They all have the same standards. They all have the same point of view when it comes to politics and so forth. So it's a giveaway when you, you can see it on the surface like that. But that's sort of background. We're, let's come back to this thing called the Federal Reserve, which is really a banking cartel. Yeah, there are a lot of banks out there, but they all formed this association years ago, uh, at least in the United States. It was done officially in, in 1913. And uh, all, the, all the banks agreed to come together and, uh, and uh, charge the same interest rates, basically, in a very narrow range, follow the same policies. And the idea was to uh, keep the control in the hands of the biggest players in the, in the game, 
just the same as an oil cartel or a coil, a, a banana cartel, a peanut cartel. You go on down the list. Now, this is, I, I dwell on this a little bit because most people have no idea that the Federal Reserve System is a cartel, just like a banana cartel. And it's not a government agency. It's not here for you folks. It's not here for us. It's here for them. And they control things, folks, in case you hadn't noticed. Uh, even when Congress uh, uh, has to be called in to uh, raise their hands and vote on the creation of a lot of money, uh, what they're authorizing the Fed to do is something they can do anyway now, is to create money out of nothing. And where that money goes, of course, if in case you hadn't noticed, a lot of it, a big, huge chunk of it goes to the government because they, they know that if they raise taxes in order to cover all of the expenses that the government has taken on, I mean, they're, they're bailing out everything that needs bailing out. They're, uh, they're buying up all the impossible debts in the world today. They're just paying off these debts uh, and they're providing housing and medical care and education and... And everything, I mean, these are like drunken sailors spending money, money. First it was millions, then it was billions, and now in case you haven't noticed, if you read your newspapers, it's trillions of dollars, and they raise their hands, and there goes another trillion dollar bailout or a mm. donation or a grant to somebody. Where does this money come from? Well, it comes from this cartel, which is, was given the power by Congress years ago to create this money literally out of nothing. That's why they don't worry about how much anything costs anymore, because they don't have to tax people for it. They don't have to collect this money in taxes. If they did, which was the old format, if, if the American people had to actually write a check or see the money come out of their paychecks to go to pay for everything that the government is spending right now, why, there'd be a revolution overnight before the sun was up. I think these congressmen and the senators and and most of the judges and so forth would be hanging from trees because the people would see that they're being plundered. Mm -hmm. But no, they can't see it when it's done through this Federal Reserve System because it's all bookkeeping. And, uh, and they, the people pay for it, of course, through higher prices. The monetary system keeps expanding. There are more and more dollars in circulation, but the goods and services don't expand. So if the dollars go up, but the goods and services don't go up, that means we have more dollars to bid against those services. And so the prices go up uh, for everything. And uh, right now, of course, we're going through kind of a, a dip because of the crash in the economy. But uh, eventually this will come wave out again, and you'll find that gas has gone back up to 3 and 4 and $5. And if this process continues, it'll be $50 and $100 a gallon. A loaf of bread will be $20. A bottle of milk will be $50 and so forth. And so these dollars will be nothing. That's how the, these expenses will be paid is through inflation. Now, that's all background. We'll come back to your question. You say, what's, what's going on in the world today with the Federal Reserve System? Well, that is what's going on today is that process that I've described in which the, uh, the government and the Federal Reserve, which really are essentially the same thing right now, we like, they like to pretend like they're independent. They pretend like the government is controlling the Federal Reserve. But in truth, if you understand the way the, the uh, Federal Reserve Charter, uh, the, you know, the Federal Reserve Act is written, if you read that amazing document, you'll find that the government has absolutely no control over the activities of the Federal Reserve System. The, the Fed is completely independent. It can create as many of these new dollars as it wishes. Uh, they can determine its own asset ratios. It can determine what's required in reserves. They can require what type of assets are, are used to justify increasing loans, basing them on those assets, and so forth. Completely independent. The only power that the government really has over the Fed is to abolish it. They can, you know, they created it through an act of Congress, and they can uncreate it. But they don't think that's going to happen soon, folks, because all of these people are beholden to this creature. Their jobs depend upon it. They, uh, they are, a lot of them are getting kickbacks. They're getting favors from the banking system. And they know that if they came against the banking system, why a lot of the newspapers, which are owned by the bankers or influenced by the bankers, because don't forget these newspapers have huge debts to the banks, and um, they depend on credit to the banks. And if the banks cut them off, the newspapers will collapse. So the banks sit at the top of this apex of monetary power, 
And nobody in, in business or in government is going to challenge the banking system seriously, because if they do, they'll be knocked out of the ring and they know it. So it's not going to happen that Congress is going to abolish the Federal Reserve System unless and until uh, people like myself and you and others and what we like to call the alternative media now, unless those people get really busy and get the word out to the public, which is really being uh, messed up. I mean, the public has no inkling of this. And it's not, it's not an accident that they don't know about this because the media is not telling them. And it's not about to tell them for the reasons which I've just uh, outlined. So now, I, I, I wander always, to, but I come back to the core question, what's going on in the world today with the Federal Reserve? The Fed, in my view at least, is, I think they feel that we're in the final stages of whatever the, the um, changeover will be from the old system to what they like to call the new system. They sometimes refer to it as the new world order. And uh, we've been moving in that direction, of course, inch by inch for many, many years. But now I think they feel that they're close enough to it that they actually can make the complete change. They're going to break down whatever's left of the old system. And they're using a lot of different things to do that at the same time. It's to just crash everything because out of the ashes they can build it and people won't object. Now, if you just said, I want to change the system to one of total uh, control over you folks, uh, I, I want you to depend on the, on the state for everything, your food, your shelter, your education, everything, and people are going to say, no way, no, you're not going to do that. But if all of a sudden you don't have bread on the table and you can't pay your rent, and uh, you're being forced out, and you have to live under the bridge, and you're, you're being attacked by something you think is a, is a horrible uh, pandemic, and everything is falling to pieces, and maybe you're going to have a foreign war, and God only knows, what, there are all kinds of things dumping on you. Finally, you're in a state of total uh, despair, and your resources are gone. You're on your knees, and you're begging for food and shelter. Now you're not thinking about, oh, what, what does the Constitution say about that? You know, nobody thinks about laws or rights, human rights or anything. They're, they're worried about survival. And this is how the game is played. And you got, uh, most people don't realize that. They don't think, they think this is science fiction or something. This is real. And so that's what's going on. I've been talking around it, but I'll come back to it one more time. One more time. What's going on with the Federal Reserve? The Federal Reserve and the banking fraternity is really at the core of all of this. If you trace Trace it to those roots I was talking about. And they intend to do more than banking. They, they have turned their banking powers, the power of money, they've turned that into a weapon to change the system from what we used to enjoy as the freest system in the world to one that first has become one of the most corrupt of the world and now is rapidly decaying, if we don't stop it, into one of the most oppressive in the world. And at that point, Money won't be so important anymore. You see, the real end game is not money, it's power. The only reason money is of any value to anybody is because with money you can get power over others. But if you have total power, then you don't need money. And sometimes I'm asked, well, what, what is this going toward if they have their way? What will it look like? And the best analogy I can think of, and now mind you, I, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm just going on the basis of what I can see and I've done a lot of reading of history lately, and I, it looks to me like we're going into something which is best described as the military society, the military world. All of you that have been in the military, you understand that it's, your position in the military isn't how much money you make. It's how much authority you have, how much power you have. Because if you're a general, if you're a five-star general or a, a bird colonel or, or you've got rank, I mean, you're provided with the finest housing you can get. All your food is there. You've got a chauffeur to drive you around in a limousine. You don't need money, brother, mm. if you're at the top of the military pole. You're, you can travel anywhere in the world at the, the finest aircraft that money can buy. You don't have to pay for it. Taxpayers pay for it and so forth. So, uh, but you have to obey. The minute you step out of line and you don't follow orders, you're in the brig. Or if you're really a bad boy, you wind up against the wall and you're shot. Now that's the way the military works, and this is the best description I can think of of the kind of a society that these people want. 
They will be the generals. They will be the colonels. They'll be admirals and so forth. And you and I will be maybe corporals or privates or sergeants if we're really good and we follow orders and we serve the upper echelon very well. We might even get to be a lieutenant. And so everybody's trying to climb that ladder and they do that by following orders to the T. Don't question it. Yes, sir. No, sir. You know, no questions. To do or die. And that's it. Don't question the morality of anything. You get an order, you do it. And that's the kind of a society. And if you begin to balk, all of a sudden you're out. You're in very bad, you're in bad shape if you're not following orders in, in the military. So uh, that's where we're headed, unfortunately. And I, 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 I think that if the American people don't wake up really soon, we're going to wind up there. There's a whole lot there to unravel for folks who, who, who may be new to some of this. And last night, uh, Ed, I actually used some of your research in my presentation called Funny Money, the past, present, and future of finance. And it was, it's, it's very uh, poignant in how you talked about the true objectives of the Federal Reserve. Even originally, it was to stop the erosion of power from New York and eliminate those small banks that had their own gold and were printing their own money. And so they wanted to be able to have that power to do that there, right? So again, it was all about power. And then they wanted to eliminate uh, the uh, private capital formation and, and make sure that if you needed to borrow money, then you had to go borrow it from them and pay their interest rates back, right? right that's and, it. Mm -hmm. and then the final one was the game of the bailout. And we've seen this bailout happen in 2008, 2009. Now we're seeing it now with the $2 trillion bailout and another $6 trillion potentially you know, bailout, and that money's going through all these bureaucracies within the government, which, you know, a lot of that money's maybe not even going to go to where, quote unquote, it was supposed to go. And it's, it's really disheartening to sort of see this system crumble. And you just said, if the American public doesn't wake up soon, we're going to be stuck in this sort of authoritarian dystopia. How, how do we wake people up and how do we stop this boulder from, from rolling? Because it seems like it's gaining steam. Well, it is gaining uh, speed, and the how is the, always the big question. Um, we know how, uh, but we don't know how to do the how, if, if I may put that mm. in perspective. The, first of all, the American people, are, not all of them, but a, a good core of them, at least 3%, that's a lot of people. But all we need is 3% who are opinion leaders, uh, who are leaders in their own right. Now, I'm not talking about the gum chewing public that doesn't care about anything you know they they just don't care they don't want to be bored with these conversations they will always follow the leaders mm -hmm. no matter which side wins they'll say oh i was always on that side but i'm not talking about them i'm talking about the three percent of the population that make a difference in the world always have history is always written by those three percent if we could just reach three percent of the people who are doers who are the shakers uh, who express their opinions, uh, people who have influence over other groups of people, the ones who are leaders of organizations, Kiwanis clubs, church organizations, PTA, you know, that kind of thing. And of course, go up the ladder and you get into the more important organizations, political parties, universities, you know, media centers and so forth. The, the human race travels in herds and they always have leaders. And it's just, it's the way the system is built. It's the way it's, humans are built most animals, as a matter of fact, at least in the, in the uh, mammal class, they have leaders. They have, they have a lead cow, so to speak. I remember when I was a kid, I was learning about these things on my uncle's farm down in Ohio. The, the cattle always had this same lead cow. And uh, when that cow got sick and taken out of the, the field for a little while, there was another one that stepped up. And all of a sudden, they all recognized that that was the lead cow. And when then that cow decided it was time to go back to the barn, everybody, all the rest of the cows followed. Well, humans are a lot like that. We've always got to have a, a lead cow, so to speak. And we, that's why we have these, our leaders, you know, we're going to vote for some great leader and then we'll follow the leader. Well, our enemies figured this out a long time ago. That's how they control the masses with so few people, that 3% I'm talking about. All they need to do is to make sure that all of those 3% are leading a herd in some way. And that, that's how they do the whole thing. So now we know that while we don't have to, uh, we don't have to reach everybody on the planet, by, not by a, a long shot, if we could reach 3% of the people who are potential leaders or existing leaders who have influence uh, in their families and in their communities, and they understood this, then, then we're ready, ready to talk about how 
we break it. And the how, that second how, first how is, of course, to spread the word to that 3%. Then the second how is what do those 3% do? How do they influence the outcome? And that is simply by moving into the power centers of society and becoming influential in them so they will be the lead cow in all of these groups and organizations. And that, now we're finally talking about politics. Now it, we get these people out of Congress and out of the Senate and out of these, uh, these official positions in government who are all there to, to be predators on the human race. They're not there to protect us or to help us. They're there to rake in as much as they can and gain as much money and power as they can. And they always have to pretend like it's for our good. But we know it's just a bunch of, it's a con game is basically what mm. politics has become. So it seems like it's on, the they're on both sides of the aisle, too. It's not just oh, both oh, sides. Oh, you both, better believe it's combined. both sides of the aisle. Yes, we might come back to that. This is the, that, that, we must come back to that, because if we don't understand that, we don't understand the tactics that are being used against us. So well, I just me, want to repeat that this, last Ed. thing I said, is the first thing we have to spread the word to reach 3%. Mm -hmm. That's how we begin. But then how we actually make it happen is that that 3% has to get it off of their couches, and out into the organizations that make things happen. You wanted to say off their asses. I know you did. But uh, couches, couches is fine. <laughs> well, let me ask you this then, because, you know, when the, the Fed lowered the rates to nearly zero, they did it on a Sunday, which was really bizarre. There are some that would theorize, perhaps conspiratorial, that that was intended to crash the economy, that if they would have done it slower... Um, that it wouldn't have been so dramatic. But the, the, so there's a question there. But the second part of it is people are also saying that the, there's a, almost a merging of the U.S. Treasury and the Fed and that at least functionally speaking, the president is the chairman now. Is, what do you make of all that? Pure propaganda. Okay, so. It's false hope. I mean, we're living in an age right now, we might come back to that too later, but one, one of the things that our opponent is really good at is, is feeding us little things that are false hope so we'll, not, we'll lower our guard and quit worrying about it. It's called controlled opposition. And first of all, anybody that thinks that the president is controlling the Fed doesn't know anything about the Fed. But I've read that in the newspapers, yeah. That's, and I've read it in mainstream newspapers. Now, that should tell you something right there. It's a, it's a universal theme that's coming out in all of the same sources, uh, news sources, that have been feeding us the lies all of these years. So that should be a, a little bit of a warning there. Doesn't mean it's necessarily uh, false, but it's how come all of these people that have been so careful about protecting us from the truth all of these years is suddenly telling us something that is true. But beyond that, the, the Fed controls the president. The president does not control the Fed. Now, it's true, and this gets a little complicated because the Fed and the, the president does name the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, right? But where does he get that name? Can you think of any president in the, uh, I don't know of any presidents that I'm aware of, actually, all the way back, maybe to as far as Jefferson, where the president even knew, I mean, I'm, I'm going way too far because the Fed didn't come into existence until 19, uh, I mean, 1913. But let's go all the way back to 1913. We don't have to go back to Jefferson. Um, we go back to Wilson or whatever it was. Um, can you think of any president that even knew the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board that they nominated. Maybe Wilson, but after that, no. Um, who then, where, did the pres where does the president get these names that he said, I'm going to nominate so-and-so as the chairman of the Federal Reserve? Well, he gets those names from his supporters, his financial supporters, his donors, and the ones who write the biggest checks, which is the bankers, secondarily would be the pharmaceutical industry. And the third would be the, the armaments industry, the uh, military uh, armaments and industrial complex. Those are the three largest sources of paychecks that go to the, to the uh, president's candidate, candidacy for his campaign. And in order for any candidate to get the support that he needs to be elected, he has to make deals with the powers that be 
He has to make a deal, and he has to agree up ahead of time. All right, if I'm elected president, yes. Yes, sir, I, to get your $20 million or $50 million, you bet I would be very happy to consider any, uh, any candidate that you would submit as a, as, a, as a good choice for the chairman of the Federal Reserve. You, you bet I would. Thank you very much for that offer. So when these guys get elected, they got this list already presented to them of who they are obligated to appoint to these important positions, Supreme Court, you know, Federal Reserve, all the rest. Um, so it's the good old boy network. It is the good old boy network. And I think people should be able to understand that because you can see that in your local politics as, as well. So the idea that the president controls the Federal Reserve chairman is absurd. The, he doesn't even know this guy, and the Federal Reserve Chairman doesn't control anything either. He represents the cartel. He is mm -hmm. the, he's been elected or appointed by the cartel to be their spokesperson. And the real power lies behind that in the banks themselves, the big megalithic banks. And that is pretty hard to penetrate. It's oh, is it even the, the trustees or the owners of those banks who've who, who, who bought, who've bought influence in every single industry, including media and everywhere. They, they're, they're, it seems like their tentacles are everywhere. They are. They are. Well, it's because the flow of money goes everywhere. And when the, when the pipe is really big and a lot of money is flowing through it, you know the source of that pipe is a bank. <laughs> so then that money goes out into the, into the economy and especially into the corporations that need loans, million, multi-million dollar loans to build some kind of a project or a building or something. Where are they going to get that money? They got to get it from the banks. Mm. So now they, in, in return for, for that getting the loan at a good interest rate, they have to make a deal. One of the deals is, well, surely, yeah, we'll take one of your bank uh, board members and we'll put them on our board of directors. If you look at the board of directors of the largest corporations in America, you'll find an uh, appalling number of bank presidents and bank board members on other board members. It's an interlocking directorate. It looks like a spider web. I've mm. seen some of these charts that people have done and it's, it, 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 it repels you because you can't, you can't follow all the lines. It's a spider web. But you, if you force yourself to go and look at the names in those little circles, why, well, I'm going to guess, well, I won't even guess, but a, a huge number, probably, probably more than 50% of them in that area, at least, are banks. And the ones that aren't the banks are in institutions that are dependent on the banks. And if yeah. you follow that one through, you find total control of the whole system by the banks. So we're living in a, folks, we're living in a system of the banks, by the banks, and for the banks. And these people literally have captured control of our government. People are familiar with the, uh, the phrase, what is it, uh, uh, something capture, regulatory capture. Now we see that in the papers a lot. Uh, well, I wonder if this is regulatory capture, just because the, the CEO of a large pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company, oh, what do you know, he's been appointed to be the head of the Food and Drug Administration. Now, isn't right. that interesting? Or, or when Dick Cheney became the vice president and he was the head of Halliburton, and then all of a sudden Halliburton got these billions of dollars after 9-11, and it was just, uh, yeah. if you were paying attention to that and you saw that, you're like, wait a second, this is, this is some corrupt stuff going on in real time. So hold on a second here, Mr. Griffin. We got just a couple of minutes left. Maybe we can wrap up around the both sides of the aisle because I think most, most people still believe that it's like sports. It's my team versus your team, and they don't realize that but it's we're all fighting one team and and so that's a little bit crazy and then maybe talk a little bit about red pill university before we wrap up well i think your analogy of the team is very good what they don't realize is that uh, both teams have the same owner and that's huh. uh, that's the solution to that one uh it reminds me of my my grandmother back in the early earliest days of television we had a little tv set about this big in our living room my grandmother she would sit there and in the afternoon she'd watch pro uh, wrestling and she took those wrestling matches very seriously and uh, of course I was just a kid but even I could see that it was you know rigged uh, th that the guy that came out with the swastika on his arm and the beard and the ugly face and the broken tooth and everything and the black shorts he was going to lose to the guy that was wearing the American flag had his hair combed and big blue eyes and a big smile on his face I knew which one was going to win because you could just tell the way they dressed. But my grandmother was rooting, of course, for the guy with the American flag. 
And, but they had to slam each other. That's the point I'm getting to. That would not have worked unless those two wrestling uh, wrestlers really hurt each other. They had, or appeared to, they had to slam each other hard. Sometimes they'd throw them out of the ring and down into the chairs, and you had to know that hurt. But that was part of the profession. Afterwards, I, I know, they went back in the, in the uh, locker room and said, boy, that was a good fight. Boy, well, when I came out of there, boy, you really threw me. Thanks, buddy. You, 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 you saved me you know, from hurting myself. They're both owned by the same company, both of those wrestlers. Now, we turn to politics. What people don't recognize is that both political parties are dominated by people who are members of the Council on Foreign Relations and the banking industry. Follow the t money, folks. Follow the power, and you'll find it's a very small group behind both parties. They put on that, a good That's show. a huge red pill right there. And, and Ed, I want to leave on that note because I want people to go search further. This is your website, redpilluniversity.org. And uh, boy, there's a lot of great content that you've got on here. You're al always publishing articles. And I believe you've got the, um, uh, a member site on here as well that people yeah. can join. Yeah, this is more than just getting information. This is getting on the team to do something about it. You know, I mentioned before the two hows. First, you've got to get people informed, and then you've got to get them activated. And the purpose of this site is to do both. So, yes, I thank you for bringing that up. Redpilluniversity.org Absolutely. is a place to learn and a place to act. And if you haven't read Creature from Jekyll Island yet, uh, pick up a copy because this is just touching the tip of a very, very deep iceberg. G. Edward Griffin, what a pleasure to speak with you. Thanks again for coming here and doing a, a brain dump. We know there's so much more oh, yeah, up there. Yeah. We can talk about it for a couple hours. It could just be the yeah. virtual G. Edward Griffin week. Well, <laughs> let's just hope I don't scare too many people away. But uh, folks, I don't, uh, I, I don't care what you think. I, somebody asked me what I think, I tell them what it is. And that's, you have to evaluate as good or bad. I think it's true, right, unfortunately, but it's not all pessimism. We can change this, but we can't change it just talking about it. We have to do something about it. G. Edward Griffin, we salute you, good sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We appreciate Thank your patriotism. You're awesome. And your Thank you so much. Great honor. Bye-bye. Good stuff right there, Mr. Travis Wright.